hey, hey. This is <laughs> Matt. This is I'm Matt. Here, man. Here's what here's what and, and, here's what nobody sees. Is nobody sees that goofy look on your face when you start this podcast with your hey, hey, hey. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> this and uh, and I actually I don't I don't want to be fat Albert. I want to be Matt Man, which is really Batman. And, 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 and you're what a woman. No. Instead of Wonder no. Woman. No. That's what I call Aaron, actually. What a woman. What a woman. Yeah. It's it's smart. Smart <clears throat> as a as a husband to call her what a woman. That is pretty smart. Yeah. It yeah. it didn't take you too long to learn. Okay. Yeah. So but we <laughs> How many we, years? I <laughs> How many years have you been married, Matt? Oh, do you I know? I don't know. Too many. No. no I didn't say that dang. out loud, did I? Um no, dang. actually it's 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 been great. We're we're coming up we're a decade now. Yeah, yeah. ten years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I think so. Uh and we're together for shoot, I don't know, like fifteen years total or something. Really? <laughs> something yeah. like that. I think that might be about Pretty right. Sure. Something uh-huh. like that. I don't no. know. I have some ex girlfriend list. Wait a minute. I dated Wait him 13 <laughs> years ago. I, I'm really bad with timelines, so don't worry about me. <laughs> what you were telling me about a new show. Uh, I think well, this is good actually because um, I like it when I, I had, I was talking about Joe D last time on the podcast, and he talked about a show on Netflix that he really, that he really enjoyed. And, um, and I, I, I definitely found myself getting addicted to that show real quick. So what it's show nice is to that? have. Uh, I don't remember because I'm not. You're good bad with, with names, names too. Either. <laughs> names and timelines. Yeah, it was about MMA fighters, um, and it was a, it was a, it was on Netflix. It was really good, but I can't remember the name of it. So sorry, guys, you, uh, I'm not helping out here. Just do a Google search. Yeah, don't don't um, put me on the spot like that. I don't do well. Uh, sorry. What's, um, uh, what's your show though? Well, so we just finished last night. Um, and by we, it's me, my wife, uh, beautiful, lovely wife, Melissa, of, of currently less than a year. We've been together, I think, six or seven, something like that, six. Uh, and we got married last May. Uh, so we're coming up on our one year anniversary. You're just showing off. Yep, yep. Uh, and our uh, oldest daughter, Maddie who's 12, uh, we have been watching, and we just finished last night, WandaVision. Matt, do you know WandaVision? What a Wanda what? (laughs) So you don't know WandaVision. I have to say I am uh, surprised and disappointed by your (laughs) lack of knowledge here. It's a Marvel uh, superhero. Oh, uh, series. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm embarrassed. Uh, You should be. Uh, And... um, they take uh, Wanda, who is the Scarlet Witch, uh, who was in the Avengers movie. She's an adventure. And um, she was, I don't know if they got married. Vision, you remember Vision from the Marvel movies? The Avenger movies? No. He's the AI Jarvis, who I think was um, uh, Iron Man's uh, AI. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they yeah, yeah, turned yeah. him into a kind of person kind of robot thing called vision and he's the one that had to die to save the universe okay. from um from that dude from the dude with the rings on his or the stones on his hand yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. thanos thanos that's right that's right so uh, and then she had to kill him his his l- wife uh wanda had to kill him Oh, like twice, I think, or once. And then she had to watch him die. I don't know. There's a lot of details. I'm probably not getting right. But at any rate, uh, Disney, it's on Disney Plus. They developed this uh, series. I don't I don't know if it's limited. I think it's just a one season series. That's all they're going to do on it. But um, it, it follows her after this event in in the uh, Avengers movie. I had no idea. In the Marvel were... Universe. Such a fan of Marvel. Uh, well, I don't. I'm not the kind of fan that you are, which is why I'm surprised you don't know this dang series. Yeah, um, it's really good. Well, I mean, not to. I just lately, I have not had a whole lot of time just with putting these programs together for you guys. Relative run readiness. No pressure, guys. Online strength I'm training just for runners. Working my fingers to the bone to serve you better. So, you know, it'd be <laughs> nice if you ordered the program. No, but uh, yeah, I haven't had a lot of time lately to to do that. 
you know that yeah yeah so but i wanted to look up and i did find it was called kingdom the show kingdom. i was talking about Dumb. yeah yeah mixed martial arts world is and that k-i-n-g space d-u-m-b <laughs> no it is not oh Kingdom is about uh, basically these martial artists uh, on the rise, and, and the, the, it has a little bit of drama in there. Actually, a lot of drama, but um, man, it was it was pretty addictive. But also, I just enjoyed watching a lot of the training scenes and oh, kind sure. of a lot of the you know, type of montages in there and just evaluating myself as a coach going, oh, is that something I would do with a martial arts guy or yeah. mixed martial arts, stuff like that? Not enough grip training for sure in that, uh, in their training montages Matt, for sure. Matt, yep. Matt, you just let us into our first topic. We're going forward with this over under thing, uh, which we did a little bit in the I last. All this out. You did. You're smarter than the average bear. Um, and so I think our first over under overrated. Something is overrated, and then the flip side of that coin is the underrated part of that. Um, and so we're going to start with the underrated uh, side of this coin right now and talk about grip strength. Yep. Yep. So one of the things that I built into the program was some evaluations on carries. So car carries, essentially, we have things like farmer's walk, where you have a dumbbell on each side, or suitcase carries, where you have a dumbbell on one side, or a kettlebell, whatnot. And um, looking at whether or not you can hold that weight with good positioning, good, good posture, obviously, but whether or not you can hold that weight for a sustained amount of time. So we're, we're looking at more capacity there. Um, although one rep max type of absolute strength is not really the focus with endurance athletes. We're also not really wanting to go to the other end of the spectrum. We have five and 10 pound dumbbells for the rest of our lives. That's, that's not going to give us enough of a stimulus, especially not past our first phases, right? So in the beginning, lighter weight can work, but we, we want to work towards that heavier weight. So why am I saying this? Part of the reason why we're evaluating grip strength, something I kind, kind of put together more recently with you, because we with mentioned me? before your deadlift oh. and realizing that you're, you're, you have good relative strength overall. But the deadlift gave you a little bit of trouble, but not probably for the reasons that a lot of people would be thinking about. It was your grip and you have a little bit of shoulder history. So we saw that your grip was slipping on the deadlifts. So going back to some of these basics and saying, OK, you need to be able to pass these grip tests. And until you do, we're going to focus on creating a little bit more of this relative strength need, starting with your grip. And why? Because essentially the deadlift or any especially bilateral movement where you're going to grab onto a bar maybe or even just some heavier dumbbells and you're focusing on triple extension. So what I mean by that is the bread and butter for our strength, our foundation is going to be triple extension type of movements. And in general, it's going to be more bilateral. And that's that's, of course, so that we can go a bit heavier. Right. So we're extending through the ankles, the the knees and the hips. That's what we mean by that triple extension. So if you get to that point where your grip is the limiting factor, now you can't go up in weight because you're limited on your grip strength. Now there's other things you can do like wear a weighted vest and that's that's okay. You can, you can do that, okay? But there's still gonna be a tipping point at some point. And I personally feel that you should earn the right to go heavier and your grip will indicate whether or not you can really go heavier, right? So we should really pay attention to whether or not we have a good grip, whether we're able to grip it and rip it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And or if we're starting to slip our grip. So a couple factors there I look at with the pinky finger. A lot of us don't think about our pinky finger when you're gripping onto a bar. And let's say you're doing, in this case, um, some 
uh, some pull-ups. You're gripping onto the bar and you start to slip that grip. The, uh, the, the pinky, if that is starting to slip away, that is part of what helps to engage the lats more. Okay, so if we are starting to slip that pinky, yet we're trying to do a pull up to improve our relative lat strength, and our lats are really important to train guys because it's part of one of your anti gravity muscles, right? So the whole goal in running essentially is to overcome gravity, right? <laughs> if we can overcome gravity better, we train those anti gravity muscles to get stronger, then we have more gulp in our ground. Right. Or yeah, we cover more ground uh -huh, and we uh -huh. a little bit more in our gate. And so helps that the arm is, swing helps yep. everything that has to do with creating uh, more mass specific force, more power. Right. So th that is that is an indication to me if we can't hold that position with our grip in a pull up that we're not even necessarily recruiting as much of the of the muscle we're intending to recruit in this case, focusing on post, like the back of your shoulders, your lats, your mid traps, etc. So working on a position like that would be um, advantageous as long as we can hold a good grip and kind of uh, keep that torque and that tension really solid, right? So that's something that we want to look a little bit closer at. Otherwise, we might not be getting the benefits we, we think we are. So if our our uh, grip starts to slip, we might start to r pull a little bit differently. And we have now internal rotation of the shoulder, for example, and we're not getting as much recruitment in the lats anymore. Our elbows flaring out. We're not packing the back, right? So we, we need to hold the scaps, squeeze the scaps, uh, squeeze our armpits down and drive our elbows towards the ground with our entire full grip on the bar, right? It is a uh, amazing that uh, the the complexity of the way the human body moves in strength training and in running, and it's very complex. So much of how you control those complex movements and so much of how you gain your stability and mobility is uh, uh, predicated on having a strong grip. Yeah, That's just crazy how that starts right there. Absolutely. And I, I also want to make sure that we focus on the other part of grip, which we have our hands that we talked about, but right. grip is also your feet. All right. So we talk about um, grip. Everybody listening, you probably can relate to the things I just talked about. But did you think about your feet at all? Right. Because when we have the, the shortening effect. Right. So when we're trying to wind up our arches and use that stability in our arches and get the trussles on that bridge to support our arch, we we need to use a shortening method. And that that means basically that we're winding up our arches with our windless mechanism benefiting uh, through our gate when we use that power through our windless mechanism that is um, in part enabled because we have a strong uh, foundation or arch through our foot, right? That's just one part of it. But so a example again is when your foot's hitting the ground, I just actually had a client in uh, earlier this morning. He's been uh, training me a while, but he was um, he was getting a little bit um, of an elevated heel during his lunges, right? And we don't want that. We want to have our toe pull as you as you're lunging, like you step forward and you start to uh, go down into the eccentric part of that movement. And we want to see that we're actually like imagine you're trying to lift your big toe up a little bit off the ground, not to where your your f foot is leaving the ground, but just where your big toe is lifting up a little bit on the way down. What that's going to do in part is make sure that our 
our foot stays in contact with the ground from our forefoot to our heel. Then as you come back up, then you push your big toe back into the ground. So see, that's a way that we can start to improve our our capacity for the windless mechanism that on the strength side of things. And of course, eventually we want to be able to get more into the power side of things with that being more automatic because mm -hmm. we did focus on the strength capacities of the foot and the grip strength there. So with, uh, with him, we saw that he was popping his heel up on his left side and we want his left leg. And we wanted to look at where that restriction was coming from. Um, just FYI, sometimes it is coming from the ankle and that's a lot. The ankle gets a lot of attention for that part of the movement. But in his case, uh, I was able to look at a little further up the chain and c coming more into the uh, the proximal part of his hamstring. So we did some work there and then he restored that position and we were able to now mechanically load and go heavy enough where his body could adapt to that stress after we did some mobility for some active mobility for the proximal hamstring. So that's just an example of really paying attention to not only your hand grip, but your foot grip. In, in other words, how you are managing those positions, um, like I like I was explaining there with, with your foot positioning. In that particular movement, there's nothing wrong to me with having your shins going forward in a positive angle. In fact, there's everything right about it. But um, having the right foot position is extremely important. So right. I believe a lot of people have, they, um, they say, yeah, lunges, will, that hurts my knee. Well, yeah, because you're probably putting all of the tension on your forefoot and especially in a traveling lunge. And then so when you go forward, the compression goes into the knee. Whereas if you do it like I describe here where you're coming down and your big toe is actually pulling up just slightly up, mm -hmm. not not like you're trying to lift your foot into dorsiflexion, but just lifting that toe up a little bit. Then on the way, when you're coming back up, then push the big toe down. You'll see that your shin angle is able to go positive and then vertical, right? So forward and vertical without any any extra pressure or pain on the knees. So I got to tell you, thing. that's one of the best cues uh, uh, you've ever had, which, ever. Which is that? I, can't, I don't even know what I said. I got to know. <laughs> What'd just the big, just the big toe up on the lunge. I think that is a that's so, it's so simple, and yet I think probably um, could potentially help the vast majority of people out there trying to do lunges. Yeah, and yeah. of course, lunges are huge for runners to do. If I yeah. had to pick one movement for the lower body, it would probably be the lunge. And I, of course, I think that if if you are lunging with um, with with this type of cue we're talking about now just you know start with body weight and get used to the positioning and even use a cue like having your hand on the wall beside you just getting used to what that feels like and then start going a traveling lunge but pay attention to whether or not your shin is coming up vertical okay as you come up or are you kicking back and going backwards a little bit with that shin right so i like to see that the shin goes vertical right mm -hmm. Uh, on the on the way up yeah. okay and um yeah, I mean, last thing I'll say is just make sure that when you're doing this type of work that nothing is causing pain. So it's not a contest of how far you can get your shin forward. I'm just saying that we should have uh, somewhat of a positive angle going forward, what's comfortable for you. And as you gain more strength and stability around your core, for example, like we talked about in the last episode, then you would probably notice that you are also getting a little bit more range now in your leg and your foot ankle complex. So it all ties in and it's, it does get kind of complex, but with Michael that I was talking about earlier, when we looked at his proximal hamstring, why? Well, the, the calves are also 
um, the, the gastroc is going to be attached to the femur condyles, which that's part of, um, the, uh, the thigh, right? So that's part of the, the back line of your leg, your hamstring is involved with that. So that's why, again, we have to look up the chain and there is a program I heard of. Um, I think it's from relative run readiness. I Rel- think it's called. Relative run readiness. I R3. Think so. Yeah. And it's called the, you know, 10, it's even free for two weeks, two weeks. Yeah. So anyways, guys, really, um, if you go through the self-assessment, you can find where some of your restrictions may be because you may be wondering, well, how am I going to know that? How am I going to see? If you put yourself through the You Know When 10, it's all figured out for you, even if you have no idea what it's figured out for you. <laughs> and all you have to do is follow the, the the movements that we picked a few movements to do for each sort of red flag or less optimal to non-optimal position. Yeah. That's brilliant. So that was the that was the underrated section of this grip, both hand and foot grip. Let's talk about the other side of that coin, the the overrated parts. Um, you know, I think one of the overrated parts is like bench press. Like, mm-hmm. how much can you bench? Or you know, how strong are your biceps? Or how much do you bench, bro? Dude, dude. Yeah, I don't know how much I benched. That's that's how much I care about I, it. Yeah, but. I bench you. <laughs> that would be actually pretty good if you could do that. Oh yeah, uh, I don't yeah. even know. But uh, listen, this is the this is the thing. I'm not saying bench press is part of the the big three, right? You so see, you have your squat, you have your deadlift, you have your bench press. Um, you know, personally, I look at the pull up as being. Uh, I think if you're talking about athlete anchors and four core, then that pull up to me has to be in that conversation. So yeah. part of your big four to me is going to be the pull up as well. Okay. But for the pressing action, I think what's a lot more relative would be uh, push ups, hand release push ups. Mm-hmm. Now, when we talk about the bench press, it's not that that's a bad thing. Um, but again, certainly it's overrated. It's uh, to me, it's, it's overrated, especially because you think about the fact that you're locking your scaps down on a bench. Okay. So when I say it's overrated, again, if you are being tested for that, like I I have coached athletes that are going to be tested for that and it can mean whether or not they are drafted. Right. And that's, that means that you definitely should be training for that. Okay. But you're uh, as a runner, your scaps need to be able to move, right. Good range of motion. So in other words, what I prefer to work on more, or is push-ups where now you have that the scapular is able to move freely during the whole movement. To me, that's a better um, relative strength adaption. And then it's not that you couldn't do something off the bench, but then I go to more like, I call them Verstegans because I learned this movement um, from Athletes Performance Institute at time, which was Mark Verstegans, um, his training. And that your body's halfway on the bench, half off. So you're basically getting that slide and glide through the scapula. It can move freely because that's the side that you're pressing from. The side that's on the bench, you're just stabilizing there. So that's not moving. Mm -hmm. So now you're getting that upward rotation of the scapula as you press. You're training that serratus anterior more. As you come down, you're able to really get more of that uh, scapula to, to, to move through its natural ranges without restrictions. So it's, uh, again, it's, it's, it's relative to you, but most runners, I would rather see how, how they can move along first in a push up progression. Sure. Okay. And I'm just going to throw in another, just off the fly. What? Overrated, underrated. What's overrated to me is starting off on your knees to mm-hmm. do push ups. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I don't think that I have not seen that people get much stronger in that capacity. And a big reason is because you are no longer head to heel strong as steel. You're right. cutting yourself off at the knees. Ah, da, 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 da. Right. But 
but um, I do believe that there's um, you're not necessarily training yourself close enough to the, the the adaption or the athletic anchor that you want to achieve. So what the answer there would be to do is you need some assistance. Again, great. Use some assistance. Take a band, put it overhead, put the band around your hips. Now you're able to have, uh, and again, to kind of steal it from Joe D, but you're using kind of a slingshot approach where you're coming, as you come all the way down to the ground, which you might not be able to do without it or especially on the pushing phase that's Mm -hmm. where most people are going to have trouble right where they normally break which is pushing the ground away you might see that they break through their lower back right and they oh they overextend their they um they they are not able to in other words keep a good stack in that position sway back yeah right so the band is actually helping to assist with that it's it's helping you at your weakest point and then you just you go from a a heavier band to a a lighter band to eventually no band so to me that's uh that's overrated doing push-ups off your knees as well um what's underrated and is using hand support or external support in this case from a band right yep. so oh that's brilliant matthew off the fly i try to i try to be brilliant um sometimes i think that i just keep talking until something comes <laughs> out right <laughs> No, but I like that progression for yeah. people yeah, and, for and sure, I don't really sure. like and even the mentality of it, by the way, yeah. like, oh, you're going to, they used to actually be called girl pushups, yeah. you know, and, um, and it's, you know, uh, that's the other part of it is like what I was that boy in gym class that didn't want to do girl pushups. Yeah. So I just did that's a so whole dumb. lot of pushups wrong. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. it, and it did not serve me well. So, you know, again, take that mentality out of it and just, uh, with, and by the way, with the banded pushups, I will say that, um, I still use it today because it allows me to, if I want to go faster, if I want more dynamic effort, if I want to overspeed, mm-hmm. then using a band allows me to do that. No matter how fast I'm going with, let's say even clapping pushups. Okay. Um, there's a certain limitation to my speed because I'm handling all my body weight. So no matter how good I get there, maybe I have a race coming up and I want to fire up, uh, you know, my nervous system a little bit more. I want to use it enough so I don't lose it. In fact, um, right now with Ben Canute this, this week, um, he's getting ready for a big triathlon and we're doing just sharpening training, I call it. So even though he's, he's certainly, he's very strong at this point, he can do clapping. He does one arm um, explosive work. One with, arm? Yeah, yeah one one handed. Um, you know, he's he's got he's gotten very strong and, and and so we look at with something like that because he's racing this weekend. I don't want to have a big eccentric part of the movement breaking him down at all. I want th- I want him to basically take a percentage of his body weight away, and I want to just focus on being able to do the concentric action more right yeah yeah so you know i will use more banded positions this week and in his case because i really just want to have that focus on the concentric action we're just we're keeping it very short a lactic under six and a half seconds for just as fast as we can go so that's kind of the the point is that we can use it enough that we don't lose it our nervous system feels really um geared up for high performance but we haven't done anything to break ourselves down so just an example there of um bands can be used for a uh, progression in a tool to get stronger. We can also use bands to, to work on getting a little bit faster. So I think it's always in our skill sets to use things like this, no matter what level we're at. So what's... Uh, yeah, baby. Yeah. What's, uh, what else we got on the over-under? Okay, so what ties in nicely after that last conversation, I think, or even just overall in these topics we talked about today for strength training... I think what's overrated is reps Mm -hmm. and uh, underrated would be tempo. Right. 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 So uh, you, you might be wondering what that really means. I, I look at programs that will say do eight to 12 reps. Okay. And that's supposed to be like the sweet spot for gaining some 
um, a little bit of strength, um, some some potential uh, strength gains that that you can achieve in that zone. It's heavy enough where you get a stimulus to get stronger, but not so heavy that you could um, get hurt. I mean, just bear with me here. I don't I don't think that's necessarily always going to be the case, but then you have the higher repetitions, say 12 to 20, that's definitely geared more towards, um, you know, metabolic fatigue, muscles burning. And, uh, so, you know, what do you want to achieve? Well, I oftentimes will give six to 10 repetitions to a more experienced athlete. And in that six to 10, you're going on the shorter range of that, you're going a bit heavier. And so that can work on the relative strength a little bit. Again, not as important to me that we do say one or two reps for absolute strength, which I think is not as important, but we want to work on maybe up to say 10 reps. Once we get to 10 reps, that pro- that tells us that we probably should and could be going heavier with good form. So mm-hmm. that's what I mean by, I don't think that even with an athlete who has qualified there in six to 10 rep ranges, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving them three to five reps on a more intensification kind of strength um, set, right? And so, but they should work up to that. The reason why I like doing, say, six to to 10 reps is just so we can stay kind of in that sweet spot. So very, if you haven't listened to our past episode about reps in reserve and rate of perceived effort, it's a very good way to kind of stay right around an eight and your rate of perceived effort. Okay. So I have two reps in reserve because let's say that, um, my max reps was, was 10, but I got to eight. Um, and I was able to stay at a rate of perceived effort of eight, right? So again, that's explained in more detail in the podcast and the previous podcast. But what I want to initially talk about with a client is time under tension because I will see them do, let's say, 10 repetitions going through a motion for maybe um, five seconds or six seconds, right? Or more traditionally where you have somebody who's doing, say, um, I've been told to do eight to 12 repetitions and they're doing all their sets in less than, let's say, 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to work initially on a Uh, more of, say, doing 40 seconds of time under tension and a lot of movements. I don't really care about how many reps they did, especially in the beginning where we are trying to get more adaptions and we want to get in enough time under tension where our body starts to learn that coordination and develop that control. And you can work on things like your breathing more. So you're focused more on the quality of the reps you're doing rather than the quantity of reps you're doing. So I was able to do, let's say, six good reps in 40 seconds. And that allowed me to gain more control through my breathing and through my coordination. Now, as I start to go more into dynamic efforts, so these are now where we're really working on controlled but faster reps in the concentric part when we're pushing the weight away, let's say, we're now under more control because we learn that with time under tension Mm -hmm. with those more triphasic or slower tempo reps to do. And now we might get to the point where in our strength phase, not might we do get to the point where we want to say, okay, can I do an average of one rep per second so I can develop more, a little bit more of my strength speed, I call it, right? Th- that is certainly something we should we should work towards, but we first have to work on that coordination development. And so with the traditional thinking is that you do more accumulation so that your nervous system gets the chance to through more repetitions gets the chance to learn more right but again my pet peeve about it is what i have seen is a lot of people are they're doing a lot of reps poorly right and they're yeah, accumulating yeah, they're focused on reps. a number and okay i got to get my 10 in and who cares if uh you know four of them were good and six of them were crap 
I got my 10. I'm doing good. People are going to get those reps done, even if the last four or five repetitions are just sloppy. They they want to get to that number. So if we throw the numbers out and we say, okay, we want to get to that time. Well, uh, maybe I now holding good form, I have to focus on taking that last couple reps down slower and really controlling that, but I'm stronger eccentrically. Now I can't seem to push out another concentric rep. So I'm just going to hold isometrically this uh, position where I'm kind of sticking and have a hard time with it, but I can hold it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm doing a little bit more for my tendons and my overall connections, if you will, there yeah. to get better at the movement. Well, it allows, allows anybody to make any movement relative to their personal strength. Right. And, you know, I just, I'll say this on a little final uh, conclusion is that this is why I like athletes to really work on this stuff before their season. And a lot of athletes, they will work on things when now they are within maybe three or four months of a race. Um, I like athletes to work on strength adaptions and really especially their base strength where they might be breaking down um, their muscles a little bit more and causing some soreness a little bit more often do that during the off season when you can afford to do that and uh, even increase your frequency. I like to see athletes that are committing to say three days a week of strength training. So there's more consistency. So talking about the accumulation part, if an athlete is doing, let's just say a total of 50 reps, right? Instead of doing um, all of those reps in one day, they might be cutting those reps up into three different sessions. And I'm talking about, you know, a, a beginner, right? Somebody who you're better off not getting overly sore, but just keeping the, the quality very, very high, right? So you might be, say, doing f uh, five reps in that 40 seconds at a time. And you might be doing that for, say, in the beginning, three, three sets, Right. So you you've gotten in about um, 15 reps that first day. Right. And then maybe in the, the next time you you do it, you get in maybe one extra set. Right. So now you've you've gotten in a, a, a total of 20 reps that day. Right. And then the next time you come in, maybe you try to do, say, two sets of 10 reps. Right. Mm -hmm. Um and you you extend that time under tension a little bit more, but you cut it down to two sets instead of three. There's a lot of ways to play around with that, but the the point is that I I know that the the body is going to learn more if you give it uh, consistency, right? And 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 it's that balance of not doing too much too soon, but also think about it, guys. If you only ran once a week. How good would you get at it, right? That coordination, that development that you need, it's that's why running at least four days a week brings a lot more results than there's actually a big difference between running three days a week and four days a week. Even. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because, you know, essentially you're running more days than you're not when you're at mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. There is uh, there was a study on that that I read, but I don't know. I've read so many studies. I can't I can't remember where <laughs> I read that originally, but um, but it makes sense. And it's really the same way for strength adaption. So a lot of people are surprised in the beginning that I'm telling them, yeah, I think you should do three days a week. It's just that they're uh, what we're doing is we're making sure they're 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 really fractionalizing it and they're not overdoing it on any one day. So the goal is that they can keep coming back and do it again. Yeah, and they're slowly ticking up the stress. Right. right. Yep. Well, you know, I think that this over and under the reps versus um, time under tension or tempo, um, you know, that's that's a really good thing for a lot of people to keep in mind, especially uh, if they're new to going into the gym, if they're new for strength training for runners. Um, it's a much easier uh, concept to handle, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, and hopefully that helps you guys. And again, um, what we've what we're doing here with the programming online is putting that process together. So um, if 
it's confusing to you to say, okay, that all sounds great. I don't know exactly how I would progress these things. Well, we we have figured that out for you. <laughs> it's there in the program. Yeah. And, you know, guys, look, we are our own sponsor. We don't have any other sponsors. Uh, we have kept it that way so that we can serve you well and not have any other things that could influence us in different directions. So once in a while, you're going to hear about how our R3 programs actually work. And I guess that's um, that's something that we hope you will all try out. But once in a while, you're, you're going to hear us talk about the program because that is what allows us to keep doing these podcasts and, and giving you the information and making this part of our our business. And so we love doing it, but um, certainly look into the program. I'm really excited about the different people that are starting the program. They're giving us good feedback, but I'd definitely like to hear more about what you think about the program. If you have tried it or if you're interested in trying it, you can always ask us questions. What we're yep. working right now on frequently asked questions. So the the last podcast we talked about um if you were to give an over under this this podcast i would say we would love to get specifically frequently asked questions what kind of questions do you have from the things we're talking about in these podcasts and or things we haven't talked about right yeah. right and um and what kind of questions do you need answered in a good program because th- these are things that i know are in our program but we we may see some of these questions as kind of giving us the direction we need to go to to fill in some gaps for you guys and then allow you to be able to confidently go through the progressions too. Yeah, so check out our program. We got a two two week free trial uh, that you can do your you know when ten assessment. You can look at the protocol movements to help you with your less optimal or non optimal movements. And then we've got spinal tap in there, and we got strength pro- progressions coming uh, by the end of this month. Uh, and, and so you can go to pendolaproject.com. That's p e n d o l a project.com. You can find us on Instagram and on Facebook, uh, Pendola Project. You can even send us an email, pendolatraining.com or pendolatraining at gmail.com and um, tell us what those questions are. Your free, frequently uh, wondered about questions, ask questions uh, about anything we've talked about or haven't talked about. Send us those and we'll pick our favorite uh, question. And Matt, what do we have for our favorite question? Well, chat today. <laughs> We have. Uh, this This would be Go Gwen Go. Gwen did donate some books to our podcast. And as you guys have heard, she's... Gwen. Um, Gwen who? Gwen was gold triathlete medalist in Gwen Rio. Jorgensen? Mm-hmm. That Gwen, Gwen Jorgensen? Jorgensen? That Gwen Jorgensen, yeah. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't talk too often about the Podium Project athletes because I, you know, I honestly... I don't want to overdo that. Uh, hey, you know, look at who I train. I must be good. But I will say that maybe you train me. You must be good. I must be good. Yeah. <laughs> maybe just maybe there's something to it if it works for a uh, gold medalist. But realize that somebody like Gwen and yourselves out there listening, you have a lot more in common in your progressions and your needs um, than you might think. And yeah. so it's actually. It's not too elite for you, by the way, these programs. Um, And even with a lot of the elites, it's really about getting back to the basics and doing them better. So, again, you'd be surprised at how many things that uh, Gwen works on that, that you also would work on. Yeah, so Gwen gave us uh, some books here, and we want to give another one away. We gave a one, gave one away uh, with our last podcast, uh, and we want to give this one away. So send us a question or two or five, and we'll pick our favorite, and then you'll get a book. Go Gwen Go, written by her sister and her mother, uh, and it's about uh, their story about uh, Gwen's road to the Olympics uh, in 2016. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, guys, thanks so much for listening. As always. And we will talk to you crazy kids next time. Bye-bye.